Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Um, you know, with, with all this COVID going around and now it is, um, you know, finally, I don't know whether it's the first or the second time, but our pastor, um, Vadim, has come down um, with COVID. And so they're resting at home. And Elena was, was meant to be here preaching um, this morning, but we thought, well, uh, if she's all good, she can come here. But then, you know, what if she gets comes down with COVID on Thursday or Friday, and then, you know, it'll be too late to find someone to to take the message. And so I said, "You rest, and uh, and I'll take um, the sermon so that you can rest and and get well." So we're thinking of them and all the other families and other people that have come down with COVID and are recovering. Um, we also think of all our families and with the kids, and you can see that if the kids are away, the church is empty. <laughs> so they're all at Casey, and so we, we're thinking of them as well, that they have a blessed service over there. Our children are precious, and we always got to lift them and bring them before Christ so that they are protected, right? They're precious, but they're vulnerable. And so we pray for them over there as they worship, celebrating um, World Adventurer Day. Um, and that's great to see as well. So here I am. Um, now I have, uh, in the past, in my messages, I've done a few of the churches, the seven churches, and um, the letters that went out. And um, today, um, that I have this opportunity, I thought we'll deal with one of the other churches. Um, I think I have two more to do, and then we'll finish with the seven churches. So before we begin, we'll um, bow our heads in just a quick word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you for this Sabbath day. We thank you, Lord, um, for this opportunity to come here to praise you, to worship you, to give you thanks. Um, we pray and lift up all our families here at Casey um, that are celebrating World Adventurous Day, Lord, and we know how important it is that the children are brought up with sound doctrine and that they learn to love you and to be obedient. I ask you, Father, to be with us here and this congregation um, here at Pakenham. Speak through us, Lord, so that we will accept what um, you have said in these letters to um, the seven churches. Forgive us, Lord, for our sins. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So our... Um, the, the church that we are going to be um, talking about today is Tytera. Um, so that's um, one of the churches um, that a letter went out to. And this also otherwise is known as the, the tolerant church. It is known as the tolerant church, um, Tytera. And so with our scripture reading, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And we, we read that from 1 Peter. So if the church of Pergamon is an example of the compromising church that is taking its first kiss towards sin, then the church of Tyterra is the church that has completely gone to bed with idolatry and is suffering the life-threatening side effects of immorality. Now, out of all these other churches, Tytera was a very small city, yet it received the longest letter out of all the churches. Even though it was the smallest, it received the longest of all the letters. So the longest letter written by Jesus to the seven churches was necessary to correct what could very well be the most corrupt of all the churches. Now we know that while John was on the island of Patmos, he was giving these letters to the seven churches by none other than Jesus himself. And we also note that each of these letters begins with a characteristic of Christ found in Revelation 1. Now you can read that um, in Revelation 1. You could start reading from, from verse 12 
um, all the way down to 16, 17. Now we also see that there is commendation, there's criticism, there's a correction, and then there's a reward at the end for those that overcome. We have to understand and realize that these were actual churches and the message given to them transcends to all churches throughout the world and is very, very relevant for us today. Make no mistake that they were only written for those times and not for the times that we live in. Now, churches are all different, yes? They differ in denominational backgrounds, styles of worship. They differ in doctrinal correctness. Their emphasis could be different, but they still all come together in pursuit of, of holiness, deeds, charity, love, and so on. And so a church which is made up of people or God's people have to honor God and give him glory. Churches should be known for rejecting sin and Satan, but that sadly was not the case in Thyatira. And so just to understand a little bit about Thyatira is, is important. So firstly, it was the headquarters for many ancient guilds, like the potters, the tanners, the weavers, rope makers, and dyers. You know, so these were different organizations. And it was actually also the center of the dyeing industry, not people dying as in dying, but in dyeing fabric. And we also, if you remember Lydia, you remember Lydia, um, the seller of purple in Philippi? Yeah, she was from Thai Terra um, when she first met Paul. Now, of course, in Thai Terra, they worship many, many idols. And Apollo, Apollo, the sun god, was one of them. So it would sound pretty significant, but actually it was the smallest and the most unimportant city Jesus spoke to. It is interesting that this is seemingly the most insignificant church of all the seven churches. But then Jesus had the most to say to them. So how does Jesus actually address them? We will look at that text, and we will look at the characteristic of Christ in verse 18. So in that, the book of Revelation, chapter 2, and if we look, starting from verse 18, if you've got your Bibles, and to the angel of the church in Tyre, right? These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. So this is how this letter actually starts. Now the church should always be a place where Christ is lifted, right? is glorified, is exalted. He wants the church to be pure and holy, without sin and intolerant of sin. Yet, throughout history, churches have been given into sin or have tolerated sin, and in some cases like Thyatira, even encouraged sin. They even advocated it. Now, there were many things that they did which was commendable, but they also had many faults. And when we look at the first three churches of Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamon, they had the doctrine and the loyalty to Christ, but they had no love. They were true to the faith, but had not yet given into sin. They were sort of drifting that way. But then when we come to Thyatira, Sardis, and Laodicea, they were way down into idolatry and corruptness. Now, the fact that this letter 
begins with these words, these things says the Son of God. Now that is different to the other letters, right? None of the letters start with the Son of God. They start with a characteristic of Christ, but not these things says the Son of God. And so why is that? Why is this different? Why does this letter start different to the other letters? It also says that who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. This is not an introduction the Titerians were hoping for. So Jesus saying that he is the Son of God is giving his authority place in the Trinity. He refers to his eyes which are like the blazing fire, seeing all things we think are unseen. His feet are like burnished bronze, like a refining fire, melting brass. Now when Jesus says there is fire in his eyes, he isn't talking about a romantic stare with eyes of deep passion. It means that these are eyes that can see through pretenses. They are the eyes of judgment. Now, our culture doesn't particularly like the idea of someone looking at us with judgment, is it? But Jesus' penetrating gaze is ultimately to heal and not to condemn. He also has feet of brass or bronze, and bronze, biblically, is always a symbol of judgment. And so this letter is so different from the others and starting with the Son of God, because we are looking at judgment here. We're looking at judgment here. And so why is, why is Jesus writing what he has written to Tyatera? Even though they had so much of commendation and they did some really good things. Jesus says, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience... And as for your works, the last are among the first. So this was a community of hard workers. They were known for their actions, not just their beliefs. The church of Tyre, in contrast to Ephesus, had love for many people. In fact, they are the only church that Jesus commended for having love. They had the faith. Their deeds and loves were motivated by their faith in Christ. They had patience endurance, steadfastness, and they were doing a lot more. Their latter works exceeded the first. That means they were growing in faith and in works, not just resting in something God did for them in the past, but sadly there was a criticism to follow. And Jesus says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. That is quite a strong criticism, yeah? In spite of all the good things that they were doing. Now, Ephesus was strong in doctrine but lacked love. Tyatira was strong in love but weak in doctrine. And they weren't willing to disagree with anyone about doctrinal heresy. Yeah. It is said that it is common for churches to be polarized in one of these two extremes. Either they will have full heads, meaning doctrine, and empty hearts. Or a heart full of love, but not sound in doctrine, or empty minds. And either polarization is deadly. God demands both love and sound doctrine. Sound doctrine and love must go together. One without the other will lead to a dangerous imbalance. You know, when you love the Lord less, you will love the world more. And when you love the world more, you will tolerate what is on offer because that is what you want. Tolerating sin is common practice. There is a lot of tolerating false teaching and following false preachers and doctrines. And Jesus makes reference to Jezebel and how she advocated sexual immorality and false teaching 
and eating foods offered to idols. Now we know what Paul says about you know, eating foods that were sacrificed to idols. But there is reference made here to Jezebel. So this was something from inside the church. It wasn't something that was infiltrating the church from the outside. Like some of the other churches, you had infiltration from the outside. Pagan practices coming from the outside. But here we have reference from within the church where we have someone advocating false teaching, all of these things. Now, like I said earlier, having just doctrine and not having love is dangerous. right? And I'm going to use the analogy um, of two elements. One is sodium. We all know what sodium is, and we all know what chlorine is, right? Now, chlorine can form chloride. So if chlorine takes on an, another element, it changes to, a, to be an ion, so I or N, right, which then it binds itself, it changes, and becomes a chloride. Now, sodium on its own is dangerous, right? Too much of sodium is dangerous. And let's think of sodium as doctrine. So too much doctrine without anything else is dangerous. And let's look at chloride as being the love. Now, once chlorine changes to chloride because it's accepted one more element, it cannot survive on its own, and it has to bond to another element to form a compound. And so when sodium and chlorine, chloride, Bond together, we get sodium chloride. And what is sodium chloride? <laughs> sodium chloride is salt. And what does salt do? Salt is flavor, taste, right? And it's the same, doctrine and love. Just love with nothing else is dangerous. And just sodium and just doctrine with no love, nothing in the heart is dangerous. But you bring the two together, it's got flavor, it's got essence, it's got meaning. Yeah? Right. I just wanted to make that point. Um, and so, one might say, well, I don't struggle with any of that. I'm all good. I'm all good. I'm okay. There's nothing wrong with me. I don't need to know any of this. But before we think that we are off the hook, Scripture also calls idolatry the same thing as spiritual adultery. Like an unfaithful wife leaving a husband or vice versa. So Jezebel, in a sense, represents things in our life that leads to idolatry, to worshipping things instead of God. So what is it that brings about this tolerance in a church like it did at Thyatira. Firstly, it is a desire for us to fit into a culture, right? Or to fit in with cultures. So how does a church that is solid in works, service, love, patience, suddenly become tolerant of heresy and sin? It isn't always sudden. But we are growing up in a culture that embraces postmodernism. What is postmodernism? It is a whole system that basically teaches that we can't really know anything for sure, that truth changes, and as long as you believe it personally enough, then it is true for you. In other words, there is no absolute right or wrong, and if you can't allow me to believe what I believe, then you know you are a racist or a bigot and you are intolerant of, of what I believe. So it is an acceptance of randomness, playfulness, whatever you want to call it. So this is the world we live in, right? Postmodernism. If you think something is right, it's right. If you think something is wrong, it's wrong. You don't have to tell me what is right and what is wrong. As long as I believe it enough, it's true for me. And so this is a world that we live in. Postmodernism is hard to define because it is a concept that appears in a wide variety of disciplines or areas of study, 
art, architecture, music, film, literature, religion, communications, fashion, technology. We live in a world of postmodernism where what you believe is right. Doesn't matter what the Bible says, as long as I believe it, that's good enough for me. Secondly, a failure to determine, acknowledge, or define sin. We no longer call sin, sin. We no longer call sin what it is. So lawlessness, rebellion, treason, spiritual adultery, breaking God's laws and commands. We start wanting to use new words that don't sound so offensive. So we stop saying sin and then we go, oh, you know what? He's struggling with that. It's a disease. You know, he's got a disorder. So we can call it so many different things, but not sin. And while we are at it, we start coming up with new definitions of words. And one of them is tolerance. We start being tolerant and accepting, even though it is sin. And so when people believe that God's law is no longer valid, they deceive themselves. Yet scripture urges us to admit our sins which contributes to our growth in Christ. Sin creates estrangement from God, causing us to fail in everything we attempt. Sin always produces separation. It never heals, but causes death. And so scripture takes a very stern view of sin because it is failure to live up to God's standard and destroys relationships, especially our relationship with God. We forsake the absolute truth for relativism. And what is that? You know, thankfully, Christians might still believe in the absolute truth, which is the word of God. But there are statistics that, you know, sadly tell us that that is not the, the case. About 44% of adults are certain that the absolute moral truth exists, which is the word of God. But all, for all the others... Um, whatever. It is what they believe. Now, tolerance means that you must not say that anybody is wrong. You have to say that all positions are equally valid. So we live in a world, again, where we just got to accept everybody's opinions and not say to anyone that you are wrong. Relativism is the belief that there is no absolute truth, the only truth that a particular individual or culture happens to believe in. So what might be okay for one culture is not okay for the other. If one believes in the truth here, it might not be the truth over there. And so if you believe in relativism, then you think different people can have different views about what's moral and immoral. We then come to the issue of closed-handed versus open-handed issues. Every Christian must use both proverbial hands to be a good theologian. In a closed hand, we must put non-negotiable doctrines over which we must fight to preserve what it means to be a Christian. And these truths can include the perfection and trustworthiness of the Bible, God as a Trinitarian creator, redeemer, Jesus' sinless life, his death, burial, resurrection, dying on the cross for our sins, salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. These are close-handed issues. They have, we have to hold on to them. They are not up for debate. We've got to hold them. They're closed. They're not up for discussion. But on the other hand, we have open-handed issues. And they are held more loosely and graciously than those doctrines that are important. So this could be, you know, what style of music do we have in church? Or what time do we open? What time do we close? Yeah. They could be, um, what sort of baptism are we going to have? Is it by immersion? Is it by whatever? Exercise some spiritual gifts, styles of worship, music. What should the, what should the, the organization of the church look like? These can be up for debate, right? We can discuss them. And so the problem that we have is when 
the the issues that we are holding in the open hand that you should hold in the closed hand and vice versa. So if we are holding closed-handed issues and we are opening up them for discussion and debate, which then leads to you know arguments and, and everything else. So the question is, are we holding in our open hand that we should be holding in our closed hand, if you can understand what I'm saying? And are there issues that we hold in our closed hands that we are opening up for discussion? So we, we've got to hold on tight to what we know is true, is the point that I'm making. Of course, then failing to stand up for the truth. There are a few verses here in the Bible. Timothy, God what has been entrusted to you, your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in doing so have wandered from the faith. It's found in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. Again found in 1 Timothy 4. For there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group, they must be silenced, rebuke them sharply, so that they will be sound in faith. That's found in Titus. Now, in the, in the book of Acts uh, of the Apostles, um, chapter 15, if you look at verse starting towards the end, um, 23 onwards, there is a, a beautiful letter that was written to the Gentiles in Antioch and Sicilia and all those places there. And it was because there was one group that was advocating that they all be circumcised. And Paul and Barnabas and Silas and all send this letter to them, to the Gentiles, and says, um, and in that letter, towards the end, it talks about remaining faithful, not eating foods that were sacrificed to the idols, and holding on to the truth. Um, and they said, you know what, we're not going to add any more burden on you because the message had to go out to the Gentiles, and that's what we see here as well. And so you see, Paul instructs us to do with heretic doctrine and those who teach it, to turn away and to have nothing to do with them, to silence them, to rebuke them, avoid their teaching, kind of the opposite of what the word tolerate means, doesn't it? Are we standing up for the truth? And if we see that there is an infiltration from outside or from within, do we stand up and, and, and we stop it? Because before you know, it will spread, and then there is corruption everywhere. There's false teaching everywhere. In the book of Matthew, we are, we are told to be careful because there will be, what, false teachers, false preachers in the times of the end. Let's think of another nice example. Um, let's say that you were doing your backyard, and you've cleared, you've leveled your backyard, you've got a new sod there, new soil, and you've planted this beautiful grass, right? The grass is all grown. Now, when you look at the back, it's just beautiful grass everywhere. And then what happens? A week, two weeks later, there's one weed that will stick out of the ground somewhere. And you can notice it straight away. Why? Because everything else is perfect, and you only got this one weed sticking out. And then what do you do? You'll go and you'll pluck that weed out, right? because you don't want to corrupt the whole of your backyard. Two or three weeks later, there's one there, there's one there, there's one there, because of you know, the seeds and the flowers and everything that's flying from everywhere. And you get a few more weeds. And you go, oh, I'll take that out, I'll take that out, and I'll take that out. Three months later, four months later, what, what happens to your backyard? You've got so many weeds amongst your beautiful grass, and then you go, you know what? I'm just not going to bother about it anymore. And that is exactly the point that I'm trying to make here. The minute you see here a false teaching, it has to be stopped because it's going to corrupt everything else. Yeah? And so, You know, I believe that we live in a day when the church tolerates Jezebel. So we may be boldly stand up for the truth, absolute truth, keeping the closed hand closed, 
rightly defining tolerance, standing up for the truth even when we stand out compared to our culture. And so Jesus says that he is graciously giving her time to repent. It says here in verse 21, And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds, I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one according to your works. And so, there is repentance, right? So Jesus says he is graciously giving her time to repent like he gives all of us. Ahab had the time and actually did repent. The last verses of the book of Kings, if you read about Ahab, he did repent. He put on sackcloths and everything, just at the right at the end. But this Jezebel in Tyre did not change her ways, so he would cast her onto a sickbed. Notice that he says that people who commit adultery with her will also face those consequences. In this case, dead children meaning there was more consequences of their sin. And Jesus said that if they did not repent, they would eventually die. And notice that he also says that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. He is saying that I know every thought and feeling you have. And David in Psalm 139 says, search my heart, O God. Are we asking God to search our hearts so that we can have that correction? And then he says, now, to you I say, and to the rest in Tyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have until I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my word until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And so... Jesus says that, you know, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. Jesus called Jezebel's practice a doctrine. He described it as the depths of Satan. What does that mean? See, Smyrna was attacked by a synagogue of Satan. If you read the letter to Smyrna, it was attacked by a synagogue of Satan. Pergamon dwelt where the throne of Satan existed. You can read that in that letter. But those churches had still resisted Satan. Tyatira, on the other hand, had fallen into the deep things of Satan. That means they were so far gone. So being tolerant of sin, being disobedient. Accepting, advocating, encouraging sin, immorality, spiritual adultery. Once we get into these things, we are then called as being deep in the things of Satan. So in verse 24, Jesus says, To the rest, there were some in the church that wouldn't put on, wouldn't put up with false teaching. And Jesus said, I will put on you no other burden. But hold fast what you have until I come. Now, isn't that great, right? That Jesus doesn't give us any other big commands or burdens. All he is saying is that whatever you already have, just hang on to it. I won't lay any other heavy command or burden on you. And if you feel like giving up or giving in, Jesus is saying to us, trust, trust us and hold fast to what you have. Don't let go. I am coming quickly. So even if it is a, a thread, a lifeline, if you are that holding on to a thin piece of thread rather than a rope, it's okay. Just hold on to what you've got. And so for those in Tyatira, with sound te theology, nothing more is needed. We just need to hang on to the truth and our love for Jesus. 
Finally, he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel, as I also have received from my father. Now, this is Jesus making reference to Psalm 2. If you read Psalm 2, it talks about the same things, that he shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel, as I also have received from my father. So here Jesus is referencing Psalm 2, another reference to judgment. In Thyatira, there was a big pottery guild, and Jesus is saying that he will give us authority like he was given from the Father to rule over the nations. We don't need to be afraid that we are some minority that is on the losing team. We have been given authority, and the truth will win in the end. And Jesus has all of that authority, and those who oppose his authority will be crushed in judgment. And then, then Jesus says, I will give him the morning star, You know, sometimes falsely, Satan also might think that he has got the morning star in, in some references. But the world might think that he has the brightness and the beauty. But Jesus says, I will give those who overcome the true morning star. And now this is just not me saying it. I want to talk about it from the Bible, from the verses, so that you know what I am saying. And if you look at the book of Revelation in chapter 22 and verses 16, this is Jesus talking. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. And what does it say after that? The bride and morning star. And so Jesus is referring to himself and nobody else. He is saying that you do this, you hold on, and I will give you myself. I will give you myself as the bright star of the morning. And so he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. There aren't multiple ways to God. There is only one way, and his name is Jesus. He is the door. He is the bright morning star. Rather than sacrifice truth on the altar of acceptance like this church in Tyterra, you know, Jesus was instead betrayed, cast out, and nailed to a tree. He made the ultimate sacrifice so that we could know the truth. Do we really know him? Does our church really know him? Do you and I have the ears to hear him? That's what happened to the church in Tyterra. Church history records that by the second century, they were no longer in existence. They didn't repent. Now, God doesn't send punishment straight away, right? He gives time to repent. Sodom and Gomorrah had time to repent. The people in Noah's time had time to repent before they could get into the ark. And throughout history, we see God giving us time to repent, and some did, and some didn't. At Tyatira, they didn't repent. They didn't heed his words. Is there an area in our life which seems maybe small or insignificant? Perhaps it is doctrinal or practical, or on the border of sinfulness, and we aren't paying attention to it? Like Pergamon, are we beginning to compromise our beliefs, our behaviors, our doctrines? We can keep tolerating sin, but one day its destructive effects will take hold of us like carcinogenic toxins. Sin will slowly kill us one day at a time one bad decision at a time. And so my prayer is that we will stand up for the truth, keep his word to the end, 
and be a church that is known for speaking the truth in love, not just doctrine, not just love, but doctrine and love. And my prayer is that we will be that church.